What are sedimentary structures? Well, sedimentary structures, they are visible features found in sedimentary rocks that formed either at the time that the sediment was deposited or shortly afterwards. Now these structures or features, they are very, very helpful to geologists because they can tell us important information about the processes that were at work in that particular ancient setting. Once we understand what processes were at work, we can then use modern day analogs to help us understand what the ancient paleo environment might have actually looked like. Now, the most fundamental kind of sedimentary structure is a stratum, and it's often just called a bed. Each individual stratum or bed is characterized by certain lithologic properties. Now, by lithology, we just mean sort of the physical characteristics of the bed. So for example, it's color or it's texture, composition or size of the individual grains within the bed. Now, most of you have probably driven through a road cut and seen dozens of these horizontal beds stacked one atop the other. Although beds can reach many meters in thickness, they must be at least one centimeter thick in order to fall into the stratum or bed classification. So how do these beds Form. Well, the most important force working to create sedimentary beds is gravity. In conjunction with other factors like current speed and direction, sedimentary beds can be deposited over very, very large areas and extend for hundreds of kilometers. Now, importantly, each bed represents an event that took place over the space of perhaps hundreds of years as when mud sort of settles out of the water column, well, that happened almost instantly as when underwater landslides produce turbidity currents, which in turn form another kind of sedimentary structure called turbidites. Now it's up to the geologist to try and figure out how much time was involved. Importantly, and in accordance with the principle of superposition, the beds on the bottom were almost certainly deposited first. Now, for more information on relative dating principles, I've pasted some links to two relevant videos in the description. Now, the next most important sedimentary feature that I want to talk about today is cross bedding. Now, since sand is the most easily transported kind of sediment, most cross beds are found in sandstones. Now, cross bedding occurs when sand grains moving in a medium, and that can be air or water, they sort of begin to pile up on top of each other, forming a feature that we're all familiar with, sand dunes. Now, when this happens, two surfaces, one on either side of that growing mound, they form. The surface that faces upstream of the flow is called the stoss side, and the surface that faces downstream of the flow is called the lee side or the slip face. Now the stoss side is characterized by a gentle angle while the slip face is sharper. As grains of sand are eroded from the stoss side of the now growing dune, they accumulate at the dune's crest. Eventually gravity kicks in and this accumulation of grains, they fall or avalanche down the slip face. Millions of grains avalanching down the slip face cause them to pile up against the slip face, creating a bed that is on an angle. Now, as this process continues, multiple angled beds propagate downstream, forming what we call cross bedding. Now, interestingly, at the same time this dune is migrating downstream, numerous other migrating dunes could form atop the first dune, producing multiple horizontal beds that are internally composed of angled cross beds. And here's what's really cool. Since these angled beds always face downstream, we can tell what direction the ancient paleo current was traveling. So in this example, the flow, whether that be air or water, remember, it was moving to the right. Now, herringbone cross beds, it's another sedimentary structure. They occur when the medium of flow reverses direction. 
Now, this usually happens in marine settings when current flow reverses as the tide goes out or comes in. But it can also occur in deserts when the direction of the wind suddenly changes. The end result is a pattern that resembles the bone structure of fish specifically the herring, from which we get the name herringbone cross stratification. Now, the last group of sedimentary structures that we'll look at today are ripples. Now, there are two basic kinds of ripples, symmetric or wave ripples and asymmetric or current ripples. Now, asymmetric or current ripples form in much the same way as dunes with propagating sets of tiny little beds that we call laminae. That's a term that geologists apply to bedding that is at the millimeter scale. Now, just like dunes, ripples will have stoss and leaf faces, hence the term asymmetrical, and they form due to the movement of unidirectional currents, such as we might find when the tide either ebbs or flows. Now, importantly, just like with the dunes, the budding geologist is able to figure out the direction of paleo flow based simply on the direction of the ripple's lee side. So in this example, the water was flowing to the right. Now symmetric or wave ripples form due to the backwards and forwards motion associated with waves. In this animation, notice that although the wave is traveling in one direction, the water molecules within the water column, they oscillate both forwards but also backwards. And it's this forwards and backwards motion that produces symmetrical ripples. Of course, there are other sedimentary structures that we have not covered. Most of the ones we've missed are those that form just subsequent to the depositional event. So things like mud cracks, low casts, and injectites, among others. Now, hang around at the end of the video, and we'll discuss the significance of injectites to a creationist worldview. Okay, so are you ready to test your knowledge? Make sure to pause the video after each question as I'm going to give you the answer almost immediately. All right, here we go. What is the special name given to this surface? If you said the slip face, then that's a good start. Now, which face is the stoss side and which is the lee? The less inclined surface is the stoss side, and the face at a sharp angle is the lee. All right, which direction was flow going given the direction of this cross bedding? If you said to the left, then great job. All right, what kind of ripples are these, and what kind of process might form them? Well, these are asymmetrical or current ripples, and they usually form in tidal zones during unidirectional ebbs and flows. What minimum thickness must a layer of sediment be in order for it to be called a bed? If you said one centimeter, pat on the back. Okay, last, millimeter scaled layers are called what? Now, if you said laminations or laminae, both are the same, and you got the rest correct as well, then well, give yourself another pat on the back, Good job. Okay, so it's time now for our spotlight on creationism. Now, these sedimentary structures are called injectites. If they are composed of sand, then we call them sand injectites. And these sand injectites are found at the base of the Coconino Sandstone in the Grand Canyon area. And they protrude down into the Hermit Formation by as many as 15 meters. Essentially, due to seismic shaking, parts of the partially or non-lithified Coconino sandstone underwent liquefaction, which just means that the sand became almost like liquid. And it was literally injected down into the partially lithified hermit formation. Now, what makes these sand injectites interesting from a creationist perspective is the interval of time that supposedly passed between the time of the Coconino sandstone's deposition and the seismic activity that caused the sand to be injected down into the hermit formation. You see, the Coconino sandstone was supposedly deposited in a desert environment 275 million years ago. Yet the seismic event that caused the sand to be injected down into the hermit formation supposedly occurred between 40 and 60 million years ago, during the latter part of the Laramide mountain building event. Now the first question is, how does desert sand get wet enough 
to undergo liquefaction. Remember, the Coquinino sandstone is interpreted as an Aeolian or a desert environment. Uh, the second and even more profound question is, how did the sand stay wet enough to be injected down into the Hermel Formation 250 million years after the Coquinino sand was first deposited? Now, a possible solution to the first question proposes that the lower part of the ancient desert was episodically saturated by the infiltration of groundwater. Fair enough. But that still does not answer the second question. Even if groundwater occasionally infiltrated the base of the Coquinino sandstone, the sand could not remain wet for 250 million years. Because of fluctuating groundwater levels combined with episodic continental uplift, all terrigenous or land-based sand deposits, they will turn into solid rock within a few tens of thousands of years at most. It is inconceivable that the Coquinino sandstone remained unlithified for a million years, let alone 250 million. It is also possible that the seismic events correlate with the deposition of the Coquinino sand, but such an interpretation conflicts greatly with the established Laramide mountain building history of North America's west coast. Now, the creationist interpretation I am putting forward here, it's not pseudoscience. Dr. John Whitmore, the young age creationist involved in this research program, published his findings in the prestigious journal Sedimentary Geology. Now, although the aim of that paper is more concerned with the nature of the injectites themselves, once thought to be mud cracks, he did manage to suggest that, and I quote, it is unlikely the Coconino could have remained uncemented in excess of 250 million years. A rather bold statement for a secular journal. Now, the most parsimonious solution to this problem is that the 250 million years separating the deposition of the Coconino and the Laramide faulting never actually existed. In other words, the two events were separated by just months, years, decades, or centuries, but not millions of years. Yet this interpretation is in direct conflict with conventional dating techniques, a proposal that although conflicting with a secular worldview, nevertheless accords well with a creationist one. Okay, so that's all from me, Ken Colson here at Creation Geology for Beginners. Look, if you thought that this video was interesting in any way, then go ahead and share it on your social media platform right now. Pound the like button, subscribe. And of course, there's a link in the description if you would like to give, I always appreciate that. All right, we'll see you next time. Thank you and goodbye.